of the committee, but we'll get started and take a, make sure we don't waste your time. Uh, on behalf of the Hourglass and the uh, Pennsylvania Economic League Central Division, we welcome you to this forum, Public Schools in Crisis. There are a lot of distinguished guests in this audience, and rather than what other people do, uh, introduce every one of them. We're going to say, you folks are great. We appreciate you being here. <laughs> we are very fortunate that you represent major involvement in our schools, and we're pleased with your interest and the fact that you're here. We want to spend our time directing our attention to the schools, and we are incredibly fortunate to have the group of presenters that you saw in your agenda. We gave you a handout when you came in that had an agenda of the events. The purpose of that was to let you know what we are doing in sequence and, th and thus to avoid having to introduce every speaker. What we'll ask the speakers to do is introduce themselves before they start and we won't spend a lot of time on their extensive background. Also, you had in that handout a part of it was place to take notes for yourself and a section that you can write out questions. What we're going to do today is ask you to see our schools in a total perspective from many, many different points of view. That's our goal. And we want to wait until after all the presentations are made in the late afternoon before uh, you ask any questions. And the questions will be asked by turning in those cards for people that will pick them up and then we will address them to whoever you wish them to be addressed to, any speaker they have spoken on during the day. Also, the website address of Hourglass is on that handout. The reason for that is we plan to make all the PowerPoints available to the public and to you folks uh, on the Hourglass website. So if you keep that, you can go back and refer to things. Some of you may want to use it with your own school districts. Midway through the session, we're not going to have a break, we're going to have a recess. <laughs> we'll have some cookies and drinks for you, and then we'll proceed with the second half. The second half, among other things, will include a panel of seven different views of our schools from very capable people. Each one has a different look at the schools to try to give you that perspective. Okay, folks, let's go to class. We appreciate your involvement with our county and our schools. Our schools face dramatic changes. Sometimes you say dramatic changes, well, maybe they won't be. Folks, they're going to be dramatic changes. The only question we have is whether the changes will be partially planned or a train wreck. We're going to outline it for you in just a few minutes. One of the purposes of this forum, in addition to giving you a complete view of the schools, is to let you can under, try to understand what schools are facing and to see if you want to participate in some plan of action to improve the situation. I have to tell you, if you came here to walk out happy and think everything's great, I strongly suggest you either leave now or turn off your hearing aid. You can see what we're talking about. School situations can't be solved by burying your head in the sand. I want to emphasize that I'm going to give you an overview of the program and in some details. The seven points of view are very important for you to see. And what we have done in our consulting work over the last couple of years is try to say to people that we've worked with, these are all very important points of view, strongly held by each group. However, ask yourself after you listen, how much of these points of view are the same. Do we have a situation where 
Seven different points of view are really more like seven silos, each very strong, but not interconnected. Our schools are going to be challenged on the revenue side in ways they've never been challenged before. And frankly, we can't expect the local public to make up the shortfall. I know there is a dream out there that this is going to go away and that there's a pot of gold sitting somewhere that will solve all these problems. Hope is not a strategy, folks. We got the piggy bank. The piggy bank is sitting on the bank. Let's look at a few things. On a big picture macro basis, state revenues are pretty well capped. And there's a real question on property taxes. It's highly likely that state revenues for the schools will not exceed the levels of this fiscal year over the next three years. There appear to be no federal money, like the stimulus money we got this year, coming down to the schools. In addition, it is likely that many school districts will decide to stop at the cap one level of real estate tax increase or some relatively small real estate tax increase given the economic environment of their communities. Of course, there's another unknown, and what about property value assessments even reducing those numbers? This is a brand new experience. We're budgeting for our schools without increased revenues. And frankly, maybe decreased revenues. <coughs> What's our situation? Voters have said no more tax increases. No increases in taxes at the federal level. None at the state level. Politicians ran promising not to increase taxes. In the old days, politicians ran on that basis and then raised taxes. We may be in different times. We may face for the first time, regardless of party, people running on that basis and actually living up to it. Here's the reason, folks. We need to understand what's going on with the middle class. Let's break our country down rather quickly. 4% would be wealthy, they're not enough to count. 16% are in poverty, and when the tax issues discussed, haven't been. So we're talking about 80% of our population in the middle class. They're basically broken into two groups. Public employees, 15 to 16%, they've managed over the last 10 to 20 years to beat uh, their wages in Standard living has increased versus inflation. 64% of the population are not in that group and they're middle class. For sure, in the last 20 years, and some economists say since 1973, this group has not kept up the standard of living. What did they try to do? They borrowed against their homes, they borrowed against credit cards. <coughs> That's over. Now we have a situation where that group of people is saying, tax increases reduce my standard of living. And it's really up in question mark whether they will be willing to sacrifice so that someone else can live in the middle class. And we've never had that experience before. It's a really big change. Back to our schools. The ugly math, as we call it. Cost increases equal employee terminations. You're going to see slides from our chief financial officer group in a few minutes, and they will outline the cost increases from salaries, insurance, pensions, state mandates, 
and numerous other expenses. What is the revenue number against that? If what I just talked about, no increase in revenue exists, all of those costs will end up requiring terminations to balance the budget, and schools must balance their budget. <clears throat> Try to bear with me now. In order to understand the challenges facing our schools, one of the big things we need to explain is the financial numbers the schools face when you compare expenses with revenues and the shortfall thereof. Once you come out with a couple of things, it's going to get a little kind of blessed, but I'll try to get through for you. Once you come up with a few understandings, there's going to be a very large shortfall, no matter what set of assumptions we present to you, and we'll present a variety of them. We'll get a presentation in a few minutes and done by our chief financial officers of four school districts, and they will present to you, probably most of you the first time, a view of all 16 school districts in our county as one, and they will show you all of the cost increases that are highly likely to occur based on the current structure of our schools over the next four years. They will also, and this is by design, show you the classic or normal revenue assumptions that you can make for what the schools might get in our district from the state government. Now, what do I mean by that? Basically, and we'll get in more detail in a minute, that says you start with this year's state money and you add to it what traditionally the state has passed down to the school districts. Money like 50% matching in pensions, money for Social Security, money for special ed, money for transportation. That normally and historically has been added to the level of state budget like we got this year. So you can assume that, and we'll show you that at some point. The purpose of showing you that, and it gets more complex, is to show you under the best set of scenarios of that, there's still $125 million more in projected cost than there would be in revenue throughout our 16 school districts. That's the most optimistic. There will be three versions of that. It's complex. The reason for three versions is because this year, our schools received money from Washington, D.C. that went to the state, that went to the school district. Will that money be added to the money the states are giving us right now? If you assume 100%, one number of revenue. If you assume 50%, it's another. If you assume zero, it's another. We'll show you all of those. Trust me, when you, get, oops, me, when you get to looking at those, what you will see is at least a $125 million shortfall or greater. That's the class. Our last, I guess, junior short straw, and we have to talk about the political wages. There's a feeling, and many of you have read, and we need to know what it means, <coughs> that the General Assembly will basically freeze expenditures to schools. In other words, no more money than schools got this year without the stimulus passage. A likely possibility. If that happens, it's not the 125 number in classic. It's the in the range of $225 million shortfall over three years in our schools. You think that's bad? You're going to hear a presentation late this afternoon from Scott Boyd, who's a representative in the General Assembly. 
Representative Boyd has classically pointed out the following. There will be no tax increases. We are $4 billion out of balance in our state budget. We will cut spending. And my friends, one of the two largest parts of the spending budget of the state of Pennsylvania is education, and a large portion of it happens to be K-12. The 229 number might be low. What does that mean? When you talk about 225, some people think it's just a number, like Erickson said, a billion here, a billion there. Well, it's more than numbers. It means 500 educators terminated or jobs not replaced, and there's not enough attrition to do it without termination. 500 educators out in our 16 school districts each year for the next three years, and then it gets worse. It's pretty serious stuff. And now, you'll see presentations of a terrific Chinese menu of how this can be played out. But we're talking about real things, major people, teachers and administrators, we're not talking about service employees, would be terminated to balance the budget on that basis if basically the state flatlines money to the schools. You can do it another way. You can raise taxes 13% a year, every year for the next three years, on average throughout the county. Over 40% tax increase. The dilemma is, we all know two things. Property values are based on the quality of our schools and the amount of taxes we pay. And there's the obvious problem of people who are on fixed income and people who don't have jobs, et cetera, et cetera, retire. Answer, why do we use the reserves? First of all, there are a lot of reserves relative to the size of the problem. <coughs> and secondly, if we pointed out the problem to you correctly, if you are running the school district and run your reserves down very much, you're borderline crazy. Because what we're saying is nobody knows what the revenue number is going to be, and you get to budget for July 1 with at least a $100 million swing in the whole county, and you can take your portion of it, in possible revenues. The take, what is the take home? One, when you get through listening to what we said is out of glass, and you listen to the very detailed, well-calculated numbers from the chief financial officers, we hope to convince you there's a real serious problem and a giant shortfall that won't go away. Number two, we want to at least have you be aware of the fact the conversation of no tax increases, no more money for schools, or cutting school budgets has a consequence. And third, since we have the good fortune of having many people in this audience who are highly involved in schools, such as superintendents and major board members, think about how your budgeting started July 1. Maybe for the first time, you want to look very carefully at what you assume your revenues are going to be. With the chief financial officers I've worked with, they're outstanding. They can give you any number you want. It's your job to ask for the numbers. And this time, I think you want to think about a variable revenue analysis when you plan your budget, because it's going to be extremely difficult in this environment to know what revenue you're going to get July 1. Folks, that's what a crisis looks like. We're going to have another section after the financial numbers, and we're going to have two very capable superintendents talk about what they're doing in education. That's a good bit different from what some of old folks like me remember high school and grade school education. Is. So we're going to give you that perspective, and we're also going to show a lot of the collaboration that's been going on trying to work between school districts together to come up with more efficient ways to run schools. The
problem is, against the magnitude of the problem, they can't move the needle very much. But we, what you'll see is there's a lot of effort going on. After break, <coughs> we'll talk about pensions. That's kind of the elephant in the room. Fortunately, for the next three years, Act 120 came into place. And what Act 120 did for us is it reduced the amount of pension payments schools have to pay right now in the short run, the next three years. The numbers we just presented would be much worse if we were funding persons' pensions at their real cost. Let me remind you, for those of you that think 120 solved the pension problem, it just kicked it down the road. And I'll remind you of our recent history. 2002, we saved and start paying for pension in 2012. 2012, we said we'll start paying for pensions in something like 2016 or 17. Guess what's going to happen in 2016 or 17? More than likely, unless the tooth fairy shows up, we'll say we can't afford to pay a whole lot more money for pensions. So we won't fund it. The problem is the pensions by that time will be funded at $55 billion against $100 billion worth of obligations. And that's optimistic financial funding. I don't want to get into that, but it's, it's not a risk of funding for those of you that are in private industry. We're getting very close in a few years to having our retirees' money equal the money in the bank and our pension fund. We've got to restructure it somehow at the General Assembly basis. How about making schools more efficient? Are there ways we can make schools more efficient without more money and do a better job of teaching our students? We as citizens have a chance to say, why don't we look at things differently? Why don't we change the rules? The rules that the schools are currently operating under. That'll be the immediate answer. Well, you can't change this, you can't change that. Okay. Might be true. Might even, many of you might not agree with some of the rule changes. That's the whole purpose. Let you think about it. But the real thing is, we're trying to think about the situation for a possibility of action. We're going to have to decide what trade-offs we want to make. What do we want to do if we want to educate our children in this economic environment? So maybe we want to rethink what, quote, can't be done. Frankly, we're a little bit upside down. As we've tried to explain to people in our consulting over the last two years, somehow or another over time, we've gotten everything backwards. Think about it. If you're a school employee, your first concern would be keeping your job. The second may be a raise or maybe some type of medical coverage and last pensions. Somehow or another, we've got it all backwards that we're going to end up, according to the ugly math, in order to fulfill some of the benefit matters, terminating the plus. Is that what we want? There were reasons it developed this way, but we're just talking about where we are, not why we got there. I think we all know that the public wants good schools. And the public wants, yeah, that's good. And the public wants teachers to keep their jobs. However, we've got to reset our expenditure thinking with a lot less, more flexibility given the tax situation we face. We've got to make some really hard decisions. With limited resources, we're going to have to decide what areas we want to make some sacrifices. Folks, this is not only in Lancaster County. This is a statewide problem. This is a national problem.
Do we want to take up the challenge as Lancaster County to begin to think of doing things differently based on the situation we are involved in? Do we as citizens want to say, look, we want to think about doing things differently and try to encourage our legislatures accordingly? It won't happen unless citizens and those involved who care about the schools decide to take action. <coughs> I guess after this presentation, many of you feel that it's about time we adjourn and go have a cocktail. <laughs> Now we'll begin, as you see the overview and our attempt to show all pieces of the puzzle, we'll begin the detailed presentation I alluded to from the Chief Financial Officer, Tim Lewis. following Monty's introduction of all of this, uh, but I, I, what I want to do is, is make sure that over the overview of this will be pretty much the 40,000 foot view. We will drop down a little bit into some detail. There's some uh, definite uh, slides here that we really want to pick on. So I'm, I'm going to change the uh, tempo a little bit. Um, I won't say it's more upbeat, but it is going to be a little quicker. Uh, my name is Tim Schramm. I'm the business manager at Salanco School District. I've been doing that for about 29 years. Prior to that, I was in banking here in downtown Lancaster, and I'm an Elizabethtown College graduate, so I've kind of been around this county for, for quite a long time. Uh, I'm, with that, I'm going to jump right in. I don't want to get behind my time here. I, I really want to move forward um, and um, make sure that everyone following kind of can uh, have their time as well. Um, in terms of balance and school budgets balancing, as Monty said, it is a continuum. So we have to kind of watch as we look forward. And one of the processes that we went through in analyzing the data, again, at the county level, as he mentioned, was the mismatches uh, along multiple levels, and particularly the multiple levels of revenue streams. So we can see that. We're going to look at some of those things. Um, also be aware that, again, in terms of what the school law is, the school law simply says that um, this can't can't be kicked down the road. Now, reserves come into play. So if there are reserves, and to the extent there are reserves, there's about $40 million in reserves across the county. Um, that type of thing can transition with the type of things that we're looking at in terms of the mismatches. Um, and again, in terms of schools, and just for those of you who don't work with this a lot, a lot of times we hear an audit, and the audit says the number, and people think of a budget as being a number. You have the two budgets. You have the revenues, which are 100% of whatever it is you get, and you have the expenditures, which is 100% of whatever it is you drive out. If the revenues won't go, then the expenditures won't go either. In terms of, uh, kind of lodged there a little bit on the slide, but in terms of what we're looking at, find the red button, um, the different weights of expenditures. If nothing else today, I want to get across the impact and the disparate impact across school districts. While we're looking at some data on the county level, even within the county level, you have different weights of how salaries, benefits, supplies, equipment, debt impact those expenditures. We have the same thing on the revenues in terms of what are the weights of the property taxes, what are the weights of um, this, the state monies rolling in. A more wealthy school district tends to have the higher weight over here, and a less wealthy school district tends to have to wait here on the state side. Um, so when we talk about state money not coming in, again, we're talking about disparate impact across the uh, spectrum of schools within there. This slide, we'll spend a few minutes on this slide uh, just to kind of drive home the point. Um, two numbers, we'll, we'll focus on this $18 million number that shows up here, I'll explain that in a minute, and about a $500 million number that is over um, on the uh, property tax, but between the basic ed subsidy, which we'll refer to as BEEF, uh, basic ed subsidy in the county, and property tax, we're about 70% of all revenues 
So these are the varsity players, these are the big boys and girls, these are the large components within Lancaster County. We can see here that in terms of Lancaster County growth, this is state money in the blue. Fully state money, <coughs> the growth from the basic ed numbers coming into the state, clean up to here. The red number represents the federal number that Monty spoke about a few minutes ago in terms of the ARRA monies. The state dropped its numbers to here, moved them up to here in the current year in 1011, but this $18 million is sitting there. That's part of the discussion that we're having, the great now, with a $4 billion, $5 billion hole at the state level. This $18 million isn't covered by anything. So as you move across, you have this yellow, which is the stimulus gap. That's the $18 million hole in the county. And in terms of this flywheel, this, this motion, this projection, if you're down here at a school district and you're projecting forward, you assume a 2% hold harmless. That's the way it's been for 25 years. Well, some of those things may not be true. To, to follow up on that, this is one of the few slides I have at the district level, but that $18 million across the 16 school districts, we have one district, School District of Lancaster, is about 5.6 million of that 18. But you have about half, half of the school districts in the county that are about a million dollars of that 18 million. So if the 18 million goes away, it's a very, very significant impact. Uh, okay, just to follow this slide, um, another important slide, because I think you can kind of look at these numbers, and again, these are coming from county levels and the county level review. But with basic education, uh, that number was $158 million, just short of 160. Benefits on the selected expenditure sides, if you look at that, on the seesaw, they're just about the same. So, so again, this is one of those aha moments when you start to align data at the county level. If we're talking about this number going backwards for 18 million, and we're talking about this number, which will grow anywhere between 12 to 13 percent based on the pension rates and hospitalization. So you're, you're shoving one number about $20 million one way, you're shoving this number $18 million the other way. So when the conversation about state funding happens, you have to realize the mismatch. Before we get off of a single line item in the county, we could be talking 20 to $39 million just on that single line item. Property taxes in the county are about $501 million, and they align with salaries and equipment. Um, again, 70% of expenditures over here, about 70% of revenues over here. And we can see the mismatches that are occurring. Property tax rates, again, if it's a 2% increase just on that, that amount, that would be about a $10 million increase. If we round those salaries up to 440 and do a 3% increase on the salaries and the projections, uh, that's going to be about 13, a little over 13 million. So maybe you can cover these items down here with the property tax, but we come back up to this line item and the mismatch remains. This one final slide, it's a little busy, but I want to point out because, again, the disparate impact that will happen across the schools. We showed how it's different on the basic ed, but this is the property tax measure, and it's a different way to show it, but in the county, we have a range of how much property tax is of a school district's budget. This is the range. One school has 28% of its budget is property tax. Another school has 70%. And then there's all the averages in between. So in essence, just as a measure, a uh, theoretical measure, you can multiply these two times together and say, well, what does that board have control of in its total budget? This district can raise its property taxes by 2.5% and yield a 1.75% increase in its overall budget. So if its budget went up 2%, it's got one and three quarters of it covered. This district, at the same 2.5%, can only drive out less than three quarters of a percent of its total budget. So if its budget went up 2%, it has a long way to go. Nice little graphic, and we're talking about weights. So we've got the balloon, and then the idea here is, what is it going to take, or what may it take? We can see the mountain, we know it's coming, and we're moving forward. So what is it going to take, and how are we going to get there? As a side comment, it may help to know which way the winds are blowing to. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about what we did. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the methodology was simply, uh, we took seven years worth of actual data, 
trended it out, analyzed it. We took the 9, 10 data and 10, 11, which we don't have all the audit information for that, but we have a ton of known data within that to really infill and make that data robust. Um, then we set up a model just to run three years. Uh, getting out beyond that is not good. We repeated that process for the revenues, and what I can tell you about the revenues is that we actually have more known data on the revenue side, simply because we know what the basic ed is and the special ed is. We know what the assessment trends are, county wage texting. So the idea is that the data are pretty solid, and again, set the model up to run for the three years. My little itty bitty globe over there inside that small. Um, I want to just put this in context in terms of the past being a poor guy. I think in terms of uh, relying on the past to continue is what makes it a poor guy. It's, it's really evident from the data review that a lot of that stuff has just simply changed. It doesn't even apply anymore. The rules have changed. So the data clearly informed us that many things have changed. And some of those are listed here, but in terms of we talked about the, the stimulus expires, um, the state budget gap, and depending on whether that's a four or five billion dollar number, the unemployment levels just remain stubbornly high. Uh, correlated to that are the wage tax receipts in the county. Aquan property tax caps with the ECI and the SAW are at the lowest points in history. Uh, probably will remain there at least a full year more before they really change. Uh, pensions, when we talk about pensions, it's not just at the district level, it's also at the state level, cities, municipalities, and the recovery case, um, and the public sector lag for that. And what I mean by that is, uh, whatever this pace is, somewhere along the line, you're probably not going to be on the front wave of that. Uh, again, back to the model, and again, just to build what we did, uh, we actually, this, is, this was the difference in what mine was talking about between, say, 100 million or 125 million to 225 million. We made some assumptions that I would call some reasonable person assumptions in, in the model. When we put a fixed expenditure growth in, we grew salaries, we grew benefits based on what we could extrapolate and calculate, uh, grew services and grew supplies. All other expenditures, including capital, capital and debt, we held at no growth. Did the same thing on the revenue side. Uh, again, the special ed subsidy, we actually grew. Transportation subsidy grew as a formula. All other state funding, which would include the reimbursement sides of Social Security and retirement. Federal funding, uh, property tax funding we grew, except D, you'll see that in a minute, the assumption D. And then other local funding, which would be interest earnings and wage tax and things like that. We actually grew that. And again, at moderate levels, reasonable person test. Anything else, not on that slide, with revenue, we held constant. Then we ran four assumptions. Now, we actually ran lots and lots and lots of assumptions. What you're seeing is the four assumptions that we're presenting today. We ran one on the minus 11, which would be the 18 million walking out the door. Then we ran one at half of that. Can we recover half of that? Well, those of you who know about the edu jobs out there, edu jobs is about half of the basic ed uh, supplement with the SF, SF funds. And then we ran another one, whole harmless, that if we can just stay where we are with no increase, then we came back, and that was the assumption D that I mentioned earlier, and simply pointed out, well, let's go back to this. What happens with that? But then what would it take? And if there's reporters in the room, which I'm sure there are, please don't say that Mr. Schramm said we're going to have this huge tax increase when I show you the number. All we're trying to do is figure out in the model what would it take under these scenarios with those fixed rate assumptions in there. <coughs> this is the chart in terms of what it looks like, and I'll set that up. We assumed for each one of the assumptions that we had $40 million in our pocket. So we start in 10-11 year with $40 million. And I'm going to go through the first three scenarios, which is the minus 11 in the blue, and the B is the minus 5, and the green is the 0. And you can see in year 1, in year 1, we've pretty much blown through all of the reserves. Uh, we are somewhere in the $20, $30 million range. If that $18 million walks away, which kind of makes sense, but again, all those other expenditures were going up, that single line item of 18 um, gets used up in that exchange of $40 million in, in reserves. We're almost dead even in the water, almost have that scale balance when we look at C with no increase. However, all the reserves are gone. What these numbers mean with D and when we ran the model is simply that, okay, if we want to stay level, level is level, we didn't burn through the reserves, we, we, we could actually run the model to try to draw those down, but we didn't. Level was level, we wanted to stay level. 
since you lose money in the front end, you have to front end load the real estate increases. So basically we take a 14.5% increase across the county on average, and then followed by a 4.6 and followed by a 4.3 to maintain this line. An interesting point of all of these numbers is that none of them are within the authority of the board under Act 1. So there is no authority to do that. It's just running the model to try to find out what would it take. So in terms of back to the balloon, um, what we can see looking at a lot of these numbers is that it is going to take more fuel. Those who want to talk about no more fuel, I, I think that's not a conversation that probably looks out to two, three, four years that we're looking at. It will require less weight, and it's not an either-or situation. Um, I think any district that tries to do it with one or the other, I, I just don't think that that's probably going to work. Um, the other point to that, and it's a nice little graphic, I, I think in terms of getting elevation, getting there quickly, having direction, I think is going to be important. Uh, Monty talked about um, the slides with the silos uh, versus collaboration. I, I think we're going to have to have a lot of collaboration to make this work. So kind of coming back down the other side, there's going to be significant cost reductions in play. Uh, and I mean in real terms, cost reductions as well as then moving forward, what is the slope of that growth that's reinstated? So after the reset, you've got to pull back. So then what happens to the slope of that growth going on? None of our data, and this is just an end, none of our data includes pass-through entities, meaning CTCs or IUs. So they will be there. Um, I had to have at least one slide that I could claim to be an oxymoron. Um, put this one in here. But again, I, I think what this, to me, what this says is that how all this is done moving forward will matter. Collateral damage is a, is a real danger. Um, so I think people are going to have to really think this through and where we're going. The recovery and timing lag, I, I think, is real. The timing and lag for schools. Again, uh, we're doing budgets right now for 11-12 that won't be audited until November of 12. We have no clue as to what our state revenues are. We have no clue as to what our federal revenues are. Um, we're, we're going to have to balance our budgets this year, that process. Uh, new normal, I threw that on there because it's a really neat term that everybody keeps talking about, but I don't think anybody's going to know what it is until five years from now. <laughs> Additional revenue streams uh, and tax base is critical. Um, when we look at this, where is it coming from? And again, perhaps a much lower slope of growth, but where is it coming from? And tax base is critical. Again, Monty talked about property taxes and the heavy reliance in this state on property taxes, but the idea is that um, there are some things that simply have to be on a statewide tax base. They simply can't be foisted downstream to property tax. Which button? There we go. Uh, cultural changes, uh, any change is hard, um, but I think, again, in terms of how do we make this happen across a collaborative type environment moving forward, uh, I, I think I'll leave you with the thought on this, that basically it's, this effort is going to take more self-reflection um, than finger pointing. This is the key. There's got to be laser focus on the resource allocation for instructional delivery for students. Um, greater good concepts are going to apply. This is a zero-sum game in many, many instances. It is Rob Peter to pay Paul. And I don't have a problem with robbing Peter to pay Paul as long as you go stand and look Peter in the eye and explain what you're doing. Um, so we have to go from there. No magic wand, but I think there's going to be a lot of local school board decisions that are going to uh, fill rooms such as this. Uh, those decisions are going to be difficult. And I think I would add, I think the General Assembly is going to have some very difficult decisions to make as well. So kind of in summary, the mismatches, as we review this data in minutia, um, they are real and they're significant. I, I think unparalleled most lifetimes, and I'll just speak for myself, 30 years in school finance, uh, unparalleled in that lifetime. Uh, there will be varied and multiple level of impact. So while we look at these data at the county level, we realize that less wealthy schools and more wealthy schools whether it's the property tax hit to a high property tax district or whether it's the state hit to a low wealth <coughs> district, you're going to have varied impact all across the realm. Um, going to be some very difficult short-term expenditure adjustments. Got to get that balloon lighter, quicker, now. 
Um, but in the long run, for sustainability, it's going to have to be balanced with solutions employed on a long-term perspective. Um, and then back to the end point, core instruction delivery must remain a priority as we move forward. Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon. I'm Brenda Becker and I'm the superintendent of Hempfield School District. I've uh, been in education for over 30 years and have spent all but a year of that in Lancaster County Schools and very proudly have served that in Lancaster County Schools. My task is to talk about what are the things we're going to have to cut to get to where we need to be. And as I give these remarks and give you some examples, this is not speaking of any one district. However, these are all things that have been mentioned by at least one district and most of them by quite a few of our districts as we look to move forward. Chapter 4. For those of you who are not educators in the room, Chapter 4 is part of the public school code that tells us what we must do, that we have no choice on. So as we look at this, one of the things that we see is we are not required to provide education until students are at least age 8 or above. Some of you may have seen recently on WGAL-TV on one of their newscasts that the school district of Harrisburg was seriously considering doing away with their entire kindergarten program. It's something that we have taken for granted that we have to do, but actually it is not required by the state. We have quite a number of academic uh, standards uh, that go all across the curriculum. However, it does not necessarily say that there are specific courses in many cases that need to be offered. Uh, there are standards that must be met, but it is left up to the school district to choose and to demonstrate how that will happen. World language is specifically mentioned in Chapter 4. But in terms of world language, we are only required to offer two languages other than English, and only one of them must be of at least a four-year sequence. You will find that in most of our schools, we offer uh, far more than what you see uh, here. <coughs> required courses for graduation, there are only four listed by name, and these are tied directly to the new Keystone exams that we will all be responsible for. You can see there, English Composition, Literature, Biology, and Algebra One. Those are courses we must offer, we must have listed. Also not required, we are not required to have art teachers, music teachers, librarians, physical education teachers, family and consumer science teachers, technology education teachers, guidance counselors, literacy and math coaches that many of us have, and there are some other ones in addition to that. We are not required to have any extracurricular activities. We do not have to have any athletics, we do not have to have any music programs. We do not have to have student government, quiz bowl, all of those things that uh, tend to make our school districts very rich and provide very wonderful experiences for growth for our students. We are not provided, or we are not challenged to, uh, to provide student transportation. If we choose as districts, we can say transportation is gone. It is up to the parents to get the kids to school. Now, I don't know how it is in all your school districts, but we're having trouble even providing transportation, getting some of our kids here. And there are not limits on class size, with the exception of special needs children. There are some exceptions there, for example, with special education. Some classrooms, if I have 15 students in and I have one more student who comes in and enrolls in the school, I have to open up another classroom and have another teacher there. But for regular ed classes, there is absolutely no minimum or maximum. So what are we looking at as potential cuts? Well, transportation is one of them. Some of our districts, but not all, offer midday runs for kindergarten because we know that we have many more working uh, two-parent families and many more working single-parent families. So that is one that would be on the top of the list to go in many districts. We also could say we're going to extend the distance that Johnny or Susie has to walk. 
you can see what the state requirements are. And those requirements, again, are only if the district chooses to, uh, to offer transportation. Now, I know, and probably many of you sitting here know, that when we were in school, we walked a heck of a lot further uh, to school than what most of our students are required to do today. The traffic also is much different. And if any of you would like to uh, go on the US Justice website and check out how many child predators we have, in all of our districts, and we try to maneuver around those as well, it is not as easy as you think. We can get additional subsidy if we have roads that the state declares are dangerous roads. But for example, in our district, Centerville Road, I don't know how many of you travel Centerville Road on any kind of basis, that is declared a safe road for children to walk on. I'm not willing, nor is my board willing, to take that liability. Uh, in fairness, though, they did declare that Route 30 is a dangerous road. <laughs> athletic programs. We can cut some or all of our athletic programs. Now, a couple things to keep in mind here. If we do cut athletic programs, we have to make sure that we are cutting an equal number of female and male opportunities. If not, then we are in, we are in violation of Title IX. So that is certainly something we have to pay attention to. Some of you may have noted that for this school year, Octorera School District, which is partly in Lancaster County and partly in Chester County, has already eliminated their middle school athletic program. It is now picked up by the community, and I have been told that it now costs students and families about $400 a piece if they want to participate in middle school athletics. We can eliminate a level of athletics and say, okay, middle school athletics gone, or we can pick and choose and say the golf team's gone, the swimming team's gone, the track team's gone. Then we will also have the parents coming to our board meetings because they will say you're taking money out of our pockets because my son or daughter is a Division I prospect and this is scholarship money. If you doubt that, come visit our offices. We also know for those of us who work in schools that for many of our students, the athletic programs, the music programs, the extracurricular programs, they are the very things that keep particularly some of our at-risk kids in school. Because we have to track attendance, because they have to keep a certain grade point average, <coughs> that helps these kids get to school, do well in school, and graduate from school. So as you can see, any number of these are potentially on the chopping block. Art programs. We can cut lots of things in art. We can get rid of elementary art. We can get rid of elementary music. We can just say, classroom teacher, you're going to teach those things from now on. Not have the content area of expertise, but we will meet the minimum level of the standards. We can cut a lot of different strands from these programs. No jewelry making. We're going to offer one painting class. You take that, that's it. That's all we're giving you. You want something else? You go take private lessons somewhere. Library programs. Our librarians are not people who sit behind desks. They are out there doing classroom instruction every single day on research skills, writing, all kinds of things. Uh, we could get rid of that. Family and consumer science programs. We can choose to meet those standards through other ways and just eliminate that whole department. Or we could choose to say we are going to get rid of certain aspects. We're going to get rid of everything dealing with sewing, fashion design, that's all gone. We're going to deal, we're going to get rid of everything dealing with cooking, baking, culinary arts, gone. So those, it, it's a whole spectrum which we can choose from there. Technology education. The one thing we hear from employers is uh, keeping up with technology and have te having technological skills is one of the things that they value in new employees. That can be gone. I would also mention that with a lot of our extracurriculars, if you talk to our kids, they will often tell you that where they learn the best about teamwork, leadership, courage, developing character is often in those athletic programs, working on teams, working with kids together. We can get rid of student services. There's nothing mandating guidance counselors. Guidance counselors play a very different role in our school than what they did when I was in school. Uh, just to give you an example, last year in over 30 years of education was the first time I was in a district where we were expelling as many elementary students as we were secondary. Students bringing in weapons, students making terroristic threats, students who have so many emotional support needs that they are presenting uh, risks to other students and to staff members. 
Uh, they are serving to provide social and emotional support, academic support, uh, in a level that we have never seen before. As we have seen the deterioration of many families, as we have seen many people who no longer feel that it is their responsibility to parent their child, they have left that up to us to do that. And that is largely in the form of the folks you see right here. We would not be able to get rid of school nurses altogether because of the many demands on their time now. Again, very different today than what they used to do. Our school nurses are dealing with everything from helping kids with eating disorders, to uh, the simplest things, dispensing medication, doing height and weight checks, doing eye exams, to uh, dealing with feeding tubes, taking care of students who can't toilet themselves. So very, very different than what we have had in the past. World language. Uh, different districts have different programs. We can eliminate all elementary and middle school languages, and we can eliminate everything but the required. We could say in any one of our districts, all right, we're gonna offer four years of Spanish and two years of Latin, that's it. You want something else, go get Rosetta Stone. Limit opportunities for students. Higher class sizes. I can have classes with large group instruction rooms just like this. I can pack it just like college lecture halls. I can have somebody standing up at the front talking to you like I'm talking to them like I'm talking to you now. I can put my notes up here. Here it is, folks. I gave it. I hope you all got it. We can do that if we have to. We can eliminate our dual enrollment program. For not, those not familiar with dual enrollment, it is opportunities for our high school students to earn both high school credit and college credit at the same time. Gives kids a head start on college, helps them to develop the proper skills, and also helps mom and dad in the pocketbook. We can eliminate some or all of our electives. Most of our schools have a very solid program of elective offerings, including many advanced placement courses, uh, one of our school districts, School District of Lancaster, has an international baccalaureate program. Manhattan Township is looking to develop an international baccalaureate program. They can all go away. Eliminate special area classes. Again, all of the things in art, music, um, health and phys ed, we can eliminate all of those. Provide only what is required for graduation for seniors. We take a look at, at the junior's transcript at the end of the year. And if they only need four credits in their senior year, that's all they're getting. They come in four credits, they're out. We won't give them a full day. That's an option that we have. Cut technology, and when I'm talking about cut, cutting technology, I'm not only talking about cutting technology for students, but we have technology is integrated through the very fabric of everything we do in our institutions now. From state reporting, to federal reporting, to how we conduct operations. We can eliminate programs such as Project Lead the Way. If you're not familiar with Project Lead the Way, it is a pre-engineering program uh, from Penn State University that many of our districts have. Project Lead the Way is one of the best examples of STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, which is being touted so highly by both federal and state governments. Our kids are getting the opportunity to get college credit for this, and they're coming out with the very skills they need that are identified at the top of the list by our employers. We can eliminate intervention programs. We have tons of intervention programs right now for kids who are not academically making it. In the past, we just failed them and that was their problem. We don't do that today. We do everything we can, not just at the end of the year, but throughout the whole year. You need extra help with math, you need extra help with reading, we're gonna get it for you. Because the sooner we can close that achievement gap for you, the better off you're going to be. Those programs are all in significant danger. Lots of programs for kids going through difficult times. Mental health issues, drug and alcohol issues, suicidal issues, um, kids going through divorce of parents, kids who have been bullies, kids who were bullied. You name it, we got it. To help our kids so they can succeed. And if you think this is expensive, if we don't do what we're doing, try looking at what we're paying to put kids, uh, uh, or put adults in jail every year, or what we're paying out in welfare on a regular basis. We can limit or eliminate some of the information we're sending out from our districts. All of our districts send out information to their residents. We are trying very, very hard to keep all of our residents informed. I would love to do it all electronically so I don't have to print paper and I don't have to mail it out. But if I go to all electronic forms of dissemination of information, then there is a sizable portion of our residents and our parents who are not going to get that information because they do not have internet access. So 
That's going to be a hard decision for us. It would also provide for much less transparency. People are saying all the time, we want to know what the decision makers, makers are doing, why they're doing it. We want input into this. This is one way we provide this. Without it, again, then there's a lot more that they don't know that is going on and they are kept in the dark. We can cut back on maintenance, but this is like a car. Pay me now or pay me later. I can make cuts, but if I cut too deep, then things aren't going to be taken care of and it's only going to result in major projects down the road. And we also have sanitary uh, safety concerns for both our students and staff to be concerned about. Some of us have senior tax programs. For those of us, uh, for those of you in the room who may not know what they are, we realize that a lot of our senior citizens may be on fixed incomes. We know that they do not have children in school any longer. So some of us offer programs where we allow the senior citizens to come in or have somebody come in for them and perform some work for us. Now, some of the work we'd have to pay somebody to do anyway. Some of the work we would not do. We simply consider this value added, but it gives an opportunity for our senior citizens to come into our schools, be part of it. They get something out of it because they get a reduction on their tax bill. They also get the feeling of being needed and involved and energized by being in our schools. I really wish you could hear uh, some of our senior citizens as they talk about their experiences. We will undoubtedly have to lay off support staff positions. We will furlough professional staff we will furlough administrative staff. None of those are easy because number one, most of the people who work in our schools are members of our community. And the one thing we do not want to do is add to the unemployment ranks of members of our community. Second, although everybody always says, why do you have so much administrative staff? If you look at what we actually have compared to the number of students and for the number of requirements, you'll find that it is not actually all that high. As student issues have developed uh, much greater challenges in the past few years, and as the state and federal governments continue to expand upon the number of reports they want, the complexity of those reports, uh, the frequency of those reports, we need to have people who can do them. Once we make whatever cuts we make this year, it's going to be very difficult to get those programs back. Because living in the Act 1 index era, which we are now, we are not in a position where we have excess money saying, well, gee, what do we want to do with it this year? We may need to cut back just as much and maybe even more for 2012-13. That's all going to be dependent on how soon the economy recovers. And what personally is very frustrating to me is the very thing that makes our public schools special and we are the only option in education. I don't care whether you're looking at homeschool, charter school, cyber charter school, parochial school, private school. We are the only entity that has to take every child who moves into our district, whether we want them or not. We can't say, I have too many, send them over to township. I can't say, your child is going to cost $85,000 a year because of the special needs they require. No, we won't take them. I can't say, these parents are a pain in the butt. You're out. I can't say, this child doesn't speak a word of English. We take every single child that comes to our door, we welcome them, and we provide a wealth of opportunities so that every child there has something that is going to help that child succeed. With the cuts that we are going to be forced to make, we are going to be taking away many of those services and many of those programs at a very time when clearly school choice, school vouchers are being pushed and more competition is being pushed. So I do not think that we are perfect in public education. I do believe we are blessed here in public education with very strong school systems and strong leaders and strong boards who try to do the right thing over and over and over again. And we're going to do whatever it takes to get through this, but whatever help you all can give us, we sure appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, well, Jennifer, it's time to stop. We'll take our opportunity to introduce ourselves. I'm Dr. Marty Rudax. I'm superintendent at Salonica School District. Good afternoon, I'm Dave Rivera, Superintendent of the School District of Lancaster. We'd like to take a moment to um, thank everyone for joining us this evening and 
you know, it's been great just hearing the information from our colleagues and stakeholders who really involve themselves in public education. You know, interesting, as mentioned earlier, and I'm sure you'll hear consistently throughout the um, afternoon, in light of the fiscal crisis, times are changing. We're really going to have to t start taking a look at public education and resources in a different uh, manner. But interestingly enough, as we're looking at, at changing crisis, public services like public, like public education are most needed now. So interestingly, when we're looking at the investment that we're making towards supporting children in our community, it's important to note that those investments, those services are needed now. Today's dialogue will provide us an opportunity to, to do just that. Share with educational stakeholders what we're doing, our challenges, but also our opportunities. You know, what's great about challenge is that it gives us an opportunity to look forward and think outside the box. And as you look at innovative educators, I'm sure you're going to see some great ideas shared today. We certainly don't expect to generate all the answers or even any answers today, but we do expect to be able to help define the issues. And in defining the issues, that is going to help us to start the dialogue to address the issues that need to be addressed correctly, as opposed to panaceas. The other point that I hope is obvious is the fact that the two superintendents that are up here reflect really the diversity within the county, whether it be the rural of Salanco or the urban of, uh, of Lancaster City. And the issues that we have are public school issues. They're not delegated by uh, socioeconomic or other makeups of any given district. So I guess uh, you're a little bit country, I'm a little bit rock and roll. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, some of the things we, we kind of, we heard and we shared earlier, um, you know, especially when taking a look at the distance, um, you know, Brenda shared that we had to walk as students. Some of us walked um, two miles to school. I hear some of us walked uphill. Um, others share that they walked barefoot um, through the snow, um, regardless of, of what the uh, conditions are. But interestingly enough, as we take the time um, to share and reflect on what today's student is never going to experience, we also have to think about how many things they are experienced in that we would never, we could never imagine. So we, we learn um, as much as we can from them in terms of dialoguing with them and involving them in what we do. But the, the fact is that technology um, they're using at home and in the workplace is changing how we, how we involve and how we think of children, how we think of kids, how we think of students every day. You know, being educators, we enjoy and actually we're amused by the way that people perceive the way that education is done. We've all been through the school system, so we all have a sense of expertise as to how education can be, can be achieved. Um, often we'll hear the phrase as well, this is how it was when I went to school, or this worked before, why don't we do it again? Uh, what you're gonna find is that um, your personal experiences tend to define the way that you're gonna find the, or address the issues as we move forward. What we're gonna be addressing here is the issues are very, very different than anything we've experienced. So when we think about it, Today's kids may never have experienced number of uh, television channels being single digit. I mean, simple things. When you think of hundreds of options that students look, look at or see today when they're at home, and, and really start to look at their inability to sometimes make decisions because they're used to the, the number of options that they have at home. When you think about children today, and um, you know, just remembering, um, watching a, a television station, kind of sticking to this theme for now. Um, remember rushing home to catch an episode of, let's say, The Long Ranger. Uh, I remember having a conversation with your parents and um, you know them telling you, hurry up and, and finish your homework because you wanna, uh, I want to catch a, a, a show on television or on the radio or, or, or get involved in an activity. You know, I, I think about I, I'm the parent of a young child of a six-year-old who's in first grade, and I remember telling him, um, hurry up and get your homework done. There's a great, uh, you know, Christmas special that I'd like to uh, watch with you. We can sit down and have some family time and, and watch watch the uh, Christmas special. And his answer was, he says, uh, Dad, just record it. Um, I'm busy and we can kind of catch that that show whenever I get a chance. <laughs> you know, I mean, it kind of blows your mind. You know, we think about, um, you know, things as simple as, you know, the, 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 the toys as Legos and Lincoln Rocks. I remember throwing material on the floor and kind of saying, build, get creative. You know, nowadays, you know, over Christmas, we spent eight hours building a Lego toy because it came like 15 pages of instruction booklets. I mean, today's kids are experiencing technology, experiencing 
product that they've never experienced, that we've never experienced before. You know, and, and funny, and, and one of the last things that um, you know, we kind of like to share in terms of some of the things that, that they share. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I love, you know, the last quote that will that pop up here. You remember when Spam was a meat product? You know, today's kids, you know, although we kind of look at it jokingly. But think about the term Spam, you know, and, and what it means to today's youth, what it means to us. It's all that other junk. It's all that other stuff that's, that's filling the inbox, whether it be electronically or metacognitively. Kids have learned to fast forward through whatever it is that they don't want to process at that time. They've learned to delete those things that at the time just don't make sense or they can't connect to. You know, one of the things that schools are responsible for doing is, is cutting through the spam. And when you're dealing with teenagers, when you're dealing with young preteens or, or young children, we have to take the time to teach them, you know, what is and what's not spam what's important for their lives now, and what's important for their lives to come. One of the other things that we'd like to share, and, and you know, really getting into why is everything we've shared important. If we look at proto, uh, prototypical U.S. industry, in 10 years, in 10 years, if all goes well, the workforce is going to look much different. We realize that 80% of the workforce is, is going to require uh, professionals who are highly skilled, professionals who uh, have to involve and engage in, in creative work. We know that 10% will be done, will be routine work done by people, and 10% um, routine work done by machines. You know, in the past, we trained our students to, to do and, and to know, to the things on the bottom part of that chart. But now we have to teach our students to be able to think, to innovate, to create. Uh, 21st century skills is a real common phrase, and that's the idea of communicating, collaborating, inventing. These are the skills that the students going forward are going to need. Daniel Pink noted that we have developed technology that can do any task that is so routine that can be scripted. Consider that companies have us in a situation now where we can get technical support or get through uh, a phone system and never talk to somebody in person. Consider that animation, which used to be drawn with Walt Disney, uh, now everything is computer generated. Okay, consider that the triptych you used to have is now a GPS. Everything that can be scripted can be technology. The future for our children and what we have to do with education is to teach them to think, teach them to collaborate, and teach them to innovate. If you're not sure that that's true, that that's the world we're living in, um, just think about Walmart. I remember five, six, seven years ago looking at a self checkout at Walmart and thinking to myself, there is no way that's going to pick up. There's no way they're going to allow folks to walk their items through a checkout counter themselves and um, bag them themselves and pay and trust that they're going to, to uh, not put a, a few extra items in their bag. And you go to Walmart today, and you're not only checking out your own items, but there is, there's self-inventory. Um, now you can walk around with your own scam gun and, and pay and provide, um, you know, and, and just kind of self-shop and, and, and self-checkout all in one. So we have to prepare our kids to not look to be the, the cashiers and the stoppers, but to be the folks that are installing, that are repairing, and that are creating the algorithms that are used in, in, in addressing um, these new technologies. Now we, we kind of felt like um, you made it when you walked into and your, and your office looks like this. Um, you know, we prepared kids and we were all prepared, you know, to be the next CEO or to be the next office professional, to know that, you know, we're going to get the, the corner office with as many windows as possible of um, all the new technologies, and, and, and that's no longer the case. You think about it, the phone. Who, who really uses a landline anymore? I mean, as we look at homes, folks are starting to disconnect their phones at home and using their cell phones as a sole means uh, of communication. As we look at today's professionals, they're, they're not sitting at a desk and answering the phone or making phone calls. They're working on their, on their cell phones, on their smartphones, and on their Blackberries. Take a look at a desktop computer. Say, uh, our youth, our, our young professionals today are not sitting and using their desktops. Have you been to a, a coffee shop? There's as much business going on in the coffee shop on laptops as there is in, in, in the corporate office. The landscape of how we do business, how we run our businesses is changing. You know, that was the fax machine. I was kind of wondering what that's even doing in the picture. 
we think we have a fax machine that we use as a paperweight somewhere. Um, because every once in a while we'll hear, we'll hear, some, we'll, we'll hear something ring and we'll wonder what the heck it is. And it's the fax machine, fax machine coming in with some solicitation. Folks are not faxing anymore. Same with the printer. I mean, any more correspondence is shared electronically. Uh, we, as we move towards a paperless system, um, you know, folks are, are not printing out as much as they used to. And I looked at the bookshelf. Uh, you know, we're doing our reading is even done electronically now. I had the opportunity throughout the county to visit a church, um, at, you know, through through uh, representing the district, and it was amazing. The, the, uh, the preacher asked, um, "Everyone, um, show me your Bibles." You know, and, and folks, you know, there were a couple folks that, that held up their Bibles, and um, <coughs> folks held up their Kindles and, and showed their Bible. Folks held up held up their iPads, their iPods, their uh, Blackberries, and I had this conversation with one, of, with one of our team members. I mean, you can hold. The technology now to read is, is, is just electronic and, and can be held and shared anywhere. You know, probably the wallet should be antiquated there as well because you get access information anywhere, anytime. You can access resources anywhere and anytime. Um, schools and classrooms have to continue to evolve. This evolution is far from over. So without a doubt, the schools have changed from what we experienced and they'll continue to change as we move forward with our students. We need to now take a look at the many things that are beyond the core business of schools. The things that have been delegated, no, actually the things that have been mandated for schools to be responsible for. Now this, this list doesn't even pretend to be inclusive. Public schools have become responsible for everything from ensuring that children get a balanced diet because we feed them two times two of their main meals during the day, to providing vaccinations to an entire community in times of pandemic, and of course you have to practice that, to protecting our students from cyberbullying and daybreak. And the diversity of students and student needs that are a part of our core business of education has grown tremendously. Dealing with homeless students, non-English speaking students, students with special needs, Brenda had referred to this whole situation earlier, needs ranging from autism to brain trauma, the responsibility and the accountability of dealing with the students is not like the good old days, nor should it be. The additional demands that this places on the resources of the public schools, however, needs to be recognized. When the criticisms are leveled that today's American school system is failing, particularly we're concerned with the school system here in Pennsylvania, we must examine the factors beyond the role of the crippling pensions contribution or the lack of flexibility created by many collective bargaining agreements, both of which still need to be addressed, and look at the responsibilities that have been heaped on districts that either districts that either distract or dilute attention and resources from what should be the school's core business of educating children and preparing them to be the most that they can be as contributing members of society and successes in their own right. You know, this year alone, as we reflect on, on the services we provide to children, just to um, kind of share some of, some of our realities and, and you know, the opportunities we have to really uh, perform our jobs well. This year, the school district of Lancaster is hosting over 150 um, Nepalese refugee families, which is an incredible opportunity to serve a population of, of refugees that, that have come with, with a specific mission, a specific dream, but also very specific needs. We look at serving over 100 homeless students throughout the year at any given course in time um, here in the school district of Lancaster. We provided over 1,000 H1N1 um, vaccin um, vaccinations. When, when most needed um, throughout the county. We provide universal feeding for all children. We ensure that every child is given the opportunity to eat breakfast and lunch at school, and quite often snacks before they go home. We provide um, GED and ESL uh, classes for families at need, for adults at need, for our parents at need. And we provide before and after school programs that, are, that not only enriches the opportunities for children, but one of the things that we don't think about, it also gives families the opportunity to work. Last year, when we couldn't start our, our after school, before and after school programs mm -hmm. on time because of, because of funding, it was amazing how many parents called and asked, All right, when are you going to start this after school program? It's the difference between me picking up a shift at work or being able to work all together. And if you paid for, if you've ever paid for before and after school care or child care, you know how expensive it, how expensive it is 
And sometimes it means the difference between you taking on an extra shift or a job altogether and, and paying that bill. And as I said, this is a this is a public school issue. So there are some things that are unique to the city, just as there are some things that are unique to the rural areas. Uh, Salanco is the largest geographic school district in Lancaster County. We cover 180 square miles. And Brenda had referred to things that are mandated and things that we don't have to do. One of the things that we do have to do is provide transportation to non-public schools within 10 miles of our of our borders of our district. Um, Salanco, for example, transports to 43 different schools. Only seven of them are ours. Uh, we have almost 40% free reduced lunch population in our elementary schools. And we have 10 different classrooms devoted to specific special needs, in addition to the special ed classrooms that are devoted to dealing with kids who have uh, just cognitive issues or dealing, uh, dealing with math and literacy. Now we often hear that using the charter school model and providing options for competition with the public school will improve performance. And as long as all the competing options have the same responsibilities and mandates, I'll tell you, I'd welcome competition. Uh, we created the Salanco Virtual Academy in response to the money that we were losing in tuition to the cyber schools. And we brought back a number of, public, of students to the public schools. And we're doing it at a significantly lower amount of money than what the cyber schools charge the taxpayer. So if competition is, is the way that things should be done to improve education, I'm all for it. Just give us an even playing field and hold everybody equally responsible and equal accountable. And I think as Brenda had referred, you're going to find an outstanding public school system in the United States, but specifically here in Lancaster County. Tim shared a great slide earlier that, shared, that um, explained where uh, most of the expenditures in the, the four school districts um, lie. And what we want to do is just take a moment to, kind of, to highlight the area that, that pretty much is, is entitled or, or um, captures the supplies, equipment, and miscellaneous um, expenditures. Really covers most of the areas that, that kind of fall outside of the realm of, of teaching and learning. Although salaries may include some of those support services, but also understanding when you take a look at the percentage of budget, where the expenditure goes, how much, there, how much of the budget actually goes to providing those non-instructional, those student services, those quality of life issues. And, and when taking that into account, it's important to understand that although the pot of money stays the same, mandates cover a greater percent of, of, those, uh, of those expenses. And as Timmy referred to earlier, one of the key issues is we don't know what that stack of money is going to be. It would be great if we had a two-year budget. The state would look two years ahead and let us know what's coming so we can plan ahead. We have to plan from the friends, as uh, Tim had in a number of his slides, because that's the best information we have. We have to look backwards, to look forward, and what's forward isn't anything what we've been dealing with in the past. Now, in Lancaster County, a number of the districts, all of the districts actually have seen this coming, and we've been working hard to reset the level of expenditures, knowing that revenues are tight. Okay, and there's a number of things that we have here, and this is an extremely small list of the number of ways that we collaborate. While the state has a focus on, um, let's bring the schools together, let's consolidate school districts, uh, there's been an awful lot of collaboration and consolidation going on without any legislative arm twisting. Okay, and this is the type of thing that is already in place and will continue to be in place as we continue to reset those expenditures. It's the only way that we can get through Okay, but there are some things that can be done that can help us in this resetting. In addition to the, uh, the items listed on, on this slide, we also enjoy great relationships with, with our partners here at the city, in the township, throughout the county, United Way, and other community-based organizations that not, not only help bring additional resources to our students, but additional resources to families and others throughout the county. And hopefully through this call, call to action, we continue to, to invest and build relationships with community stakeholders to continue uh, bringing low-cost um, resources to kids and families as well. We're going to need help from the legislators, and we're going to need help from the community and from the parents. But with the legislators, let's talk about that for just a second. We need help beyond just revenue. Uh, we know that revenues are tight. Okay, we've seen this coming. Um, we know that throwing money at a problem doesn't always make sense. We live in Lancaster County, okay? 
we have a reputation for knowing the value of the dollar, and we get a dollar's worth of service from a dollar uh, that we collect. Uh, but we also have many items that we've listed so far in our presentations as well as the others um, are items that that can be in responsibilities that can be defrayed, there are mandates that can be relieved, there are partnerships that can be uh, assisted, that can help us take those responsibilities, meet them in other ways, or have others who are responsible meet them, so that the revenues that we are using to meet those responsibilities can continue to help us in doing our core business of education. So one of the things that we're asking, um, you know, understanding that the current crisis leaves us resource um, poor in certain areas. However, we, we, we like the opportunity, districts are, are pushing for the opportunity to, to be forward thinkers, to be innovative. Um, we can do that by lifting mandates. Um, we can be innovative by, by releasing, um, relieving us of some of the restrictions that exist with current funding. You know, as we take a look at, at what's mandated and what we, we must provide in terms of services, whether or not we agree it's what's in the best interest of students, we sometimes find ourselves um, handcuffed or, or landlocked in, senses around, in, in a sense around creating great opportunities um, for kids and families alike. So one of the things that we want to push is, as folks look to support um, public education, as folks look to support our public schools, is not always asking for additional tax dollars or, or additional revenue, but let's think outside the box and allow innovators to be innovative. <laughs> let's look outside the box and allow funding to, to meet the needs of children, as identified by the professionals. Let's not allow, um, you know, not only legislation but, but court um, summary to, to dictate how we run our schools. Let's allow the needs of children um, to drive how, how we invest in resources. So to conclude, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Hourglass for allowing us to be a part of this forum. Uh, and certainly, and I'll speak on behalf of Pedro and myself, we certainly welcome being a part of any conversation that will help us address some of the things that we've suggested here today. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, Jennifer is fixing up the slides. I'm sure you join me in Hourglass and those of you in the audience and being very appreciative of the dedicated people we have in our school system who are willing to take the time and effort to come in here and, and help us all see better the situation in our schools and the opportunities we face. of it at the end of the last presentation. One thing we can think about is that there's no more money coming into schools and we want to improve performance in the schools. Why don't we think about changing the rules? We want better schools. We want schools to perform better. Our schools, in some cases nationally, are falling behind. And yet, as you can clearly see from people involved in the schools, there's a Herculean effort going on to try to improve the results in our schools. Basically, do we want to keep doing the same thing we've been doing and hope there'll be better results? You just listen to two superintendents suggest there can be better ways. We don't have to keep banging our heads against the wall. If we want to change the rules, I'm talking to people that have to think about it seriously and see if you look at the rules that might be changed, do you think this is what ought to happen and do you want to get involved to try to encourage that to occur? If you want to wait on the General Assembly to unilaterally take action, we might get a little older before things happen. That's not the way they function. They listen to citizens that care. We're a group of people that are here because we care about the schools. What's one of our dilemmas right now? A lot of people are trapped. 
in trying to change the schools. If you're in Department of Education, it's extremely difficult for you to give up turf to change rules. As Baker superintendents are, it's a challenge for them in many areas of rules to advocate a change in a rule that might offend somebody that works for them, even though it might be better in the long run. It's a very high risk strategy. It's not exactly a system designed, despite the great efforts, for the internal people to make all the changes. If we change the rules, we're going to satisfy some people and disappoint others. We'll give you a few ideas of rule changes. You'll have to decide as citizens whether you think that this would, these would be helpful to help our schools. Remember, with the dilemma we face in the economic environment we painted picture to you earlier, some type of action needs to take place. It might just be, as alluded to in the last two speakers, that we think about changing the rules and structure of schools. A lot of conversation about charter schools. What's the aim? Probably to take a small section of our students and educate them differently than in the public schools. But the likelihood of that, educating the entire students, building off new schools, is a long range and a slow process. Think about it. Why do we do it that way? Why not say, look, if it's good for charter schools, it's good for public schools. Why can't public schools operate on the same rules as charter schools. They've already got the students. They've got the talent. It's just a way of thinking about it. But you've got to change the rules to do it. Rules were set up under a different set of circumstances. This is a new world. We clearly showed all the different things in this world. We can't keep thinking of what we always thought. Okay, now we get to a few of the specifics. The reason for these, but the right to terminate for unsatisfactory performance. Coupled with that is a specific review process that we might consider and ask to be established. Why? Because people need to be treated completely fairly if indeed they're not performing up to standard. Yes, today it is possible to terminate somebody for unsatisfactory performance on schools. However, the procedure is extremely questionable and it opens this up for a lot of lawsuits. And what that means is with all the other workloads on our schools, there's an inclination not to move out of people, out of people who are performing unsatisfactory. We need to make it so that that's easier to do. Allow elimination and furlough for economic reasons. Folks, this is a rule the General Assembly want to think very seriously about implementing within the next six months. Those of you involved in school systems, thinking about your budgets for July 1st, realizing in many cases you have significant shortfalls, and those of you that know the rules of program changes and plans and how difficult and slow that is, you may not be equipped to actually balance your budgets effectively starting July 1, let alone in the future. You could do it if it was a fair process for furlough for economic reasons. What's behind this? There are a couple of lifestyle reasons that these changes might be considered by. What are they? Like any organization, our schools are so blessed with so many dedicated, hardworking people that are carrying the, the majority of the load of educating in the classrooms and otherwise our students. But also like that organization, there's some people that aren't carrying their weight. They're good people, but they probably are not carrying their weight because they're in the wrong category. How can 
in that day. Well, let's think about it. An individual goes to a fine school such as Millersville, wants to be in education, gets a degree in education, and works for a number of years, let's say 10 years. And suddenly discovers, I don't like being in the classroom. I can't tolerate being with kids. Well, they can't have them, right? Well, in private industry, people change jobs nine times. It's not happening in public education. What happens to that person? They look around, they're satisfied, they try for a job, they be writing grants, try for a job in administration. Perhaps that's not a bad Now they don't like what they're doing, and they look at private industry. Over the last 10 to 20 years, it's difficult to match the salary level that's available in private industry. And certainly when the individual looks at the medical benefits, the job security, and when they look at the pension and say, holy smoke, in private industry I need to save a million dollars to get the same amount of my pension as a public school employee, they decide, I'm going to stay in the job. But remember, they get to stay in the job, as we outlined before, with pretty good job security. What we don't need in our schools are a small section of people who think the best part of being in schools is June through August. <laughs> What's happening? We have some people that basically have golden handcuffs on. They're good people. They're in the wrong side. But they see that they're better off staying in the school system for 20 or 30 years until finally they can retire. And are they really obligated to give their best? Is that what we want to do for both them and for our students? If we had the right to counsel them with real intent to make them perform better or find other employment, I would guess that a bunch of them, given the alternatives, would decide to measure up and do the job they're capable of doing if they had the other alternative of not having a job. So we would actually improve the performance of some people who would stay, but others would be given an opportunity if we put those two rules in to uh, find other employment and let somebody that a young graduate of a field that said they can't find a job in teaching right now come in and try to see if they can do a better job teaching the kids. Let me run through a few other ideas that you can consider. We might consider hiring retired teachers with no benefits. It's a different concept, but it comes from both needs of some people that are retired and the fact that we're trying to teach kids with limited resources. You heard it before the previous two superintendents. We need to reduce school funding restrictions. About everything that comes down to the schools now is tied up in strings. We have limited resources. What we need to do is use those resources as efficiently as they can be used. So one thing you might think about talking about and recommending is eliminating the restrictions now on the schools and really trust the, the people that are working so hard to educate people to use the, the money efficiently. In short, on time. You heard two superintendents <coughs> say, please give us some more flexibility. You see all the things they're trying to do. It would help to rescind Act 1 requirement. Most of you know what that is, but basically new money comes into the schools, you have to use it for new investments. We're short on existing money. I think we can miss you that. Why don't we use the money that we can afford to put in schools the most efficient way we can to operate our schools? You heard the plea for 
state budgets on a multi-year basis, or please some idea of what state budget numbers for education would be in March or April. I warned you earlier that if the General Assembly does what it usually does, we'll be trying to budget our schools with the most uncertain revenue stream we've ever experienced in our schools in the late second quarter and have no <coughs> earthly idea how much money the state's going to give us. Can you imagine, and those of you that sit in those jobs on school boards and superintendents, think about what you're facing without any help from the legislature. We've got to start, I think many of you may want to start begging the legislature to do that for you because your job is really a challenge in this environment without that rule. Now, there a few other things. Might state, change state certification requirements. And it would be really nice if the General Assembly went on a, but, uh, a little uh, uh, diet and quit mandating publicly proper, popular things without money and without cost benefit analysis. In the old days, maybe there was enough revenue to cover it over. Now it's serious. There's not money at the school level, and these extra things, nice to do, ought to be fully funded. Another requirement that is worthy of consideration, this would be debatable, depending on what your point of view is, is to eliminate arbitration and mediation. Or at least, if that did not occur, indicate that mediation and arbitration should take into account the economic conditions of both the school district and the community in which it resides. There were good reasons for mediation previously. The world is changing a little bit. We may want to think about, as citizens, whether we should change that. School construction dollars are limited. We're challenged. You may want to think about saying, why should we be paying the prevailing wage for school construction? That runs up the cost of school construction and we don't have a lot of extra money to start with. If you can't buy that argument, maybe you can say, look, the $25,000 cap to eliminate that ought to be raised dramatically so that we can function more efficiently. Right now it's not as big a problem, but we have to streamline the approval project process for construction projects. You need to do a new construction. It can often take two years to get it approved. In days of inflation, the cost can rise while you're just trying to get approval for a necessary project. A few other ideas. Reinstate the waiver mandate process and have it apply to all statutory provisions that affect public school districts. Another real change you might consider is allow the local option of one prime contractor. Another rule change, what about saying to part-timers you're not entitled to retirement benefits? You heard it? Superintendents talk about all the exams that are required. We've got Keystone exams, federal government exams. Why do we need both? Could we eliminate, say, the Keystone exams and spend more time teaching kids? What about looking at the day a teacher works and consider a professional day? Today, it's considered more blue-collar hourly work. The teachers came through and got educated in schools like Millersville as professionals. It's, you might want to consider saying, why don't we just treat it that way? Another area is allowing grouping of multiple districts for special education. Think about that. We've got to come up with some scheme or some set of efficiencies to reduce the spiraling cost 
of special education. I know it's politically sensitive, but we've got to think of every possible innovative way to do this more efficiently. These are just a few examples of some of the research we've been doing as our glass and others for consulting purposes. Pretty well known nationally, this is not anything special. Uh, these are not new or novel ideas. It's getting, deciding whether we want to implement them and use them and allow our schools to function that will be a little bit different. Without money, we need the right tools so that our schools can innovate. We've got to somehow to do or rather do a lot better with less money. The problems are complex, they're enormous. And public education, as much as it's already changed, if you've heard, is going to require massive future changes. I think you can see from presentations today, and those of you who know many others in the school system, this system is well, We have leadership. We have talent. Why don't we consider, do you think, as a group of people, to encourage changes of the rules that would untie them to do the job they could do even better to save our schools and save our students? Basically, change the rules. <coughs> we as citizens have to do this. Again, as I said before, this is not something those of us concerned with schools can delegate to the General Assembly. It requires action of the public and communicating based on the fact you're here, you're obviously interested in our schools. The challenge is if you are willing to talk to people that aren't here and push those rules and changes to untie the schools that you think are appropriate. I thank you at this point. I think the bell rings and we go to recess. There are cookies and uh, drinks in the Cleveland lobby, right? For everyone, and in about 20 minutes, we'll be back and start the second half of the presentation.